Hi, I'm Lori Lewis, and welcome to Walking with Giants, the view from six foot nine. And by the way, I'm not the six nine here in this team. <laughs> My co-host is Coach Ray Scott, who is one of the um, top 30 Detroit Pistons of all time, and he was NBA Coach of the Year in 1974, and as we go along, you'll get to know that he also has been a very successful businessman. Coach, are you ready for this show? I Indeed I am, Laurie. It is hard not to be ready for a show where we can speak of sports heroes that I've known from yesteryear. That's right. That's that's the intent of the show is uh, tell us uh, why that name struck you for the title of the show and our Facebook page and your upcoming book, Walking with Giants. Well, I, I believe that as we go through life, we as we are successful, we walk with giants. We walk with people that lift us up, hold us up. Uh, we walk with people that are great unto themselves. Uh, and we walk with people who people don't see on a, uh, I would say, a basis of, oh, they're a giant, you know, uh, a la uh, a doctor, lawyer, uh, tax expert, person that uh, fixes up your house, your lawn keeper. We don't see them as giants, but so many times in our lives, they too are giants. And so most people, when they think, uh, of my reference of walking with giants, they see a Wilt Chamberlain or a Bill Russell or an Elgin Baylor or a Paul Arizon, um, a Bob Lanier, uh, Nate Thurman. They see these men of immense size and immense skill and think, oh, that's what Ray means when he says walking with giants. But I like through my life to recognize people as giants who just sit around that table of directors to me and uh, for me and bring so much to my life. And so Walking with Giants, I think, as we get into it, is going to be a book that's going to be very interesting to people to see how one would have a perspective of their total life and not just a sports life. Coach, you've led a really interesting life. Um both inside the NBA and after that. And so there are characters and people that have stuck with you in your heart and mind through the years. And let's start with one of the first ones in your basketball career. Uh, One of the first in my basketball, actually I started playing basketball at eight years of age and I was quite a reader. And one of the things that attracted me as a young person, as I was reading uh, were the great heroes of the 20s. This is when Grant and Rice and Walter Camp, these great writers, were coming up uh, uh, up the line with just great historical pieces. And I love history. And it's, I think it's one of the things that developed my interest in history. And they had uh, talked about the greatest athletes in the 20s because the 20s, if one can recall, is when... Sports became front page. Sports sports became a section in the newspaper. And it happened because of writers like Grant and Rice who had the people that they could epitomize as great sports heroes by season. And so what they were given in the 1920s was the great Babe Ruth, the great Red Grange, uh, the four horsemen of Notre Dame, um, they wrote about Jack Johnson, whose time had passed, but their hero at that time was Jack Dempsey. The, the you know uh, these these great great athletes of the time. But you know, like any young kid, I was drawn to the statistics of what uh, these people accomplished, and I wound up uh, at that age from eight to eight to about ten. I wound up in that group that just couldn't believe how great. George Herman Ruth was the babe and I just researched everything I could on him and I was just a little kid at that time in Catholic school and I remember going to a library and getting a comic book uh, that was written uh, by mission by our missionaries at the time and the comic book was on George Herman Ruth because he had attended St. Mary's orphanage he was consigned actually 
to St. Mary's Orphanage in Baltimore, Maryland at seven years of age. And here's a man that became quite probably, if not the greatest baseball player of all time, certainly one of the greats. And so I was just inspired as a young person to read about someone like Babe Ruth. You're still learning about him, learning new facts about him. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. I still, I, because it was such an interesting piece. Um, what happened for me with Babe Ruth um, is I was interested in his development uh, because most people uh, athletically who have uh, uh, development or they develop into these superstars, they have incredible backstories as to how they got there. And uh, George Herman Ruth, the babe, uh, was a kid, like I said, that was in an orphanage at seven years of age until he was 18. But he, he ran into a brother because the uh, St. Mary's Orphanage was run, in Baltimore was run by the brothers. And so Brother Mathis, uh, this uh, athletic, uh, athletic brother, used to play baseball and teach the babe how to play baseball. Now, remember, the babe was there in St. Saint, uh, Saint Matthew's, I mean, St. Mary's, excuse me. He was there because he was an incorrigible child at seven years of age, which is very, very difficult for anyone to believe. But his parents were saloon owners, not bar owners, but saloon owners. And I had a thought. I said, you know, how many nickel beers must you sell just to make a dollar? Mm. And so this they had to be very, very hardworking people. And in working so hard, uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ruth, and being bar owners, their children were neglected to a great degree, and they grew up on their own. Well, among them was the babe. And babe was, when I say incorrigible, I mean incorrigible. He chewed tobacco. He smoked. He drank. And at seven years of age, they said, we're going to lose this kid if we don't do something. So they took him to uh, St. Mary's. Uh, they, they knew of St. Mary's. They took him to St. Mary's. And St. Mary's was uh, a few things. One of them is it was an orphanage, but it was also a residential piece for kids that, like the babe that were having problems, and also a reformatory. So he kind of blended in with this group of kids and some kind of way at St. Mary's, and they say it's the miracle of St. Mary's, that they got the babe straightened out to where he became such a great athlete at St. Mary's, and as they played against other schools and other competitions, people said, this kid has professional skills. And I've always said how interesting it must be to go from seven years of age to 18 years of age and then be released back into society, which is what happened with the babe when he signed uh, with the Boston Red Sox. Coach, um, you and I both love sports history, and I'm from Chicago, you're from Philly. I don't see that sort of um, discussion really going on right now about these great figures. Why Why are the backstories important? You know, I, I think because, the back, well, the backstories are important because they tell of how one arrives at their station. And that's always interesting to me. I'm sure it's going to be, uh, in our book, it's going to be interesting to many, 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 many fans who have probably lost that era of sports. And I think that people today would love to discuss the backstory of Pete Rose, the backstory of Willie Mays, the backstory of Hank Aaron. The back story of Orlando Cepeda and Roberto Clemente, how they came to the United States and could not speak English, and they were taken in by the players on the team and taught English and who ordered food for them and took them uh, you know, out to restaurants, clubs, and, and mainstream. And so there's, there's many, many, many interesting backstories um, that players have that I know of that I think fans would be interested in, but I know one of the greatest backstories of all time for me has been the backstory of the babe. Yeah. 
Well, you have a unique perspective as a professional athlete yourself, and then an even more unique perspective having been a coach on that kind of professional level. And so um, you you get to show us what goes on behind the scenes and to see things from a different perspective. And I think that's what's going to be fun about this show. I've been learning so much from you because um, it, it really is interesting. I'm, I'm a lifelong sports fan, but hearing your perspective is, is so much fun. And, and you have a lot of personal anecdotes about all these great athletes as well. People that like, well, Wilt Chamberlain that you actually yeah. played with since high school or played against, I should say. Yes, I wish I had played with him. <laughs> but, yeah, I played against, I played against him. Uh, Wilk was an 18-year-old senior when I was a 16-year-old junior. And uh, I, I happen to often remind people that our record uh, in my junior year was 17-3. and three, And all three losses were to Overbrook High School. And Wilk Chamberlain was responsible because he was a star of the Overbrook High School team. Um, but it was just, you know, but there's an incredible backstory there with Will. Uh, people don't know that he was a shy person, uh, that he was a, a, a kid that just grew up uh, feeling put upon. And, and he, that the two players I know that felt that way to a, to a huge degree who became incredible superstars were Will Chamberlain and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, who Will took, Will took, Jabbar under his wing, but Wilt himself uh, was in that iconic class of Ruth and Gehrig and Johnson and Robinson and Lewis, when you, uh, Jackie Robinson, when you mentioned those players, Wilt's name is certainly in that mix. Um, and so it makes me proud to have the association, to have competed against him, to have the friendship with him. Uh, until he passed, his untimely passing, we were friends. We were still speaking on the phone. And so, again, the backstory is, is can be so illuminating for what it is that we're going to do with the book and with our podcast and with sharing this information with people. And, and one of the things I was, I was thinking as you were speaking, one of the things we could share is that, you know, I grew up in locker rooms all over the world. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> you know, and a, and a locker room is really. I mean, we won't be telling tales out of school, but right. a locker room is an interesting way to grow up because it develops a language and a culture of its own. And so there's accepted behavior in the locker room. There's unaccepted behavior in the locker room. Leaders prevail in the locker room, or leaders develop in the locker room, and. You know, it's it's very often your skills are displayed on the field uh, of battle or on the courts, um, but your leadership abilities and your your ability to think and put things together occurs in the locker room. Your intellect is real, in my opinion. Your intellect is really developed in that locker room of uh, you know twelve to twenty to to 50 players, you know, somewhere in there, there's a group that you're involved in in a locker room. But so much is developed, your development is in that locker room. Wow, interesting stuff. Yeah, that's going to be fun to explore more. Um, let's go back to the babe. And he, he, there's such a mystique, of course, around him. Um, and he really was responsible for saving baseball, especially because of the Black Sox scandal at that time. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, boy, that, that's good stuff because one of my favorite players that I had read about, and, and that's going to be a great part of a backstory too, is Shoeless Joe Jackson, yeah. who was considered the great baseball player of his time. But because of the Black Sox scandal, uh, it, it really just denigrated baseball. But the Bay, because of that era uh, in the Roaring Twenties, really brought it back because he became a what they call a prodigious long ball hitter, which was unknown at that time because not only was there the scandal, but they were also coming out of the dead ball era. And the dead ball era means that the baseball had no lift to it. it you know, you couldn't hit it out. So a great baseball player like Ty Cobb, 
understood that and didn't swing for the fences. He was an offensive machine because he could hit that the single was a double, a double was a triple, a triple was an inside the park home run if Ty Cobb hit it. And he just understood how to play the game. He had an incredible batting average, uh, but he was also one of the most uncomfortable human beings to be around uh, that there was in the history of baseball, and I'll just leave it there. But the babe was very comfortable to be around. Although he was a big, robust man, he was he was the life of the party. Uh, and in fact, it's it's said uh, if the babe hit 350 lifetime, imagine what he could have done sober. Oh, wow! <laughs> wow! <laughs> yeah, what what an interesting character. I mean, when you really think about what it would have been like to be around him, you know. Yeah, just uh... yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I think as you're saying that, I, you know, because pictures come to mind. This big, gregarious man, you know, bigger than life. Um, uh, and I think, you know, the other thing I, I did, I don't want to forget this. The thing that I that happened with the babe is in babes being gregarious, and and some people can see it as overbearing or what have you. The great Lou Gehrig who was on the same team, it's rumored that they didn't speak to each other. Oh, no because kidding. Lou I never was, heard that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Lou Gehrig was a very dignified, quiet, cerebral individual. Big, strong man, but very cerebral. And he and, I, 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 I hear that he and the babe had difficulty uh, in conversations. It's been told to me that if, uh, you know, uh, uh, the babe, because the babe batted third and Garrick batted fourth, that if the babe hit a home run, if he hit it out of the park, and he would come back to the uh, home plate, he'd come to tag up at home plate, where normally you get a handshake or an attaboy or a back pat, uh, they would they would not even acknowledge each other. Wow. So those those are stories that that I've heard in in passing and and being in locker rooms. Those are the interesting things that you hear uh, in locker rooms that a lot of times the press uh, are not privy to. Yeah, you know, a lot of sentimentality is built up around both of their stories. Of course, those movies. My my all time favorite movie is The Pride of the Yankees. You know that Gary mm-hmm. Cooper played Lou Gehrig and. Of course, as a kid, that's what got me interested in learning about him. Well, 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 the Iron Horse was was something. I mean, he was just a big, strong man, and he's probably, uh, and his backstory to me is so great because he was a man of such great humility. Uh, He was stricken with his disease, the Lou Gehrig disease. They, They named the disease after him. And the story goes, that one day he was walking down uh, New York, down 5th Avenue, 8th Avenue, 7th Avenue in New York, and a writer approached him, and he said, well, hi, Lou, how you doing? I know you're dealing with this uh, this awful disease, and things are, you know, how things working out for you, and he said, well, things are going pretty good, because I just heard that they came up with a cure, and so Lou said, you know, to the writer, isn't that great? excuse me, that they came up, it looks like there's something that really can help people with this awful disease. And so the writer said to, to Lou, he said, well, Lou, that's really great. This will, this will help you. This is, this is so great that you know, you, they've come up with something. How will it help you? And he said, oh, no, it won't help me. You know, but nine out of ten in the next uh, uh, group of people that catch it, this, this it could help them. Wow. And I always thought about what great humility that you would think that way. And, you know, have, and, and you've been one of the finest athletes um, in the history of sports, and yet you have the humility to think of others and not yourself. What an example. So that really was the time period. Well, and, and I think you were saying earlier about the newspaper reporters are really what sort of helped grow the – mystique and mythology of baseball. I mean, obviously we were playing for a long time before that, but this seems to be the era that really made it the American sport. Well, that that came during my dream period. If you want to read about a period in American history that is so interesting, it would be the Roaring Twenties. 
I mean, I absolutely love the Roaring Twenties. The music, the athletics, yeah. uh, the entertainment. Uh, this is, Remember, if One Life Opera, you know, this is the time of Caruso, of the great Caruso. And, uh, the, the, you know, perform, uh, what is, what's the great song? I, I can't, oh, I'm, I'm losing it. But he has such a great song that he sings that uh, it, was, it was a classic from the 20s. Um, and oh, so Sole that, Mio. Uh, Maybe. Uh, uh, it was uh, Figaro. Figaro. Or it Figaro. Could, yeah, I'm an opera person, yeah. so we won't yeah. go there, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, yeah, that was, the show could easily turn. Yeah, but we don't. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> that time, Laurie, had to be one of the most incredible periods, in my opinion, in American history, because all of these elements came together. You know, the glamour of a babe, uh, the college, because college football was the game uh, in the winter. So now you have Red Grange, number 77. Uh, you have the Four Horsemen of Notre Dame uh, in South Bend, Indiana. You have the great Jack Dempsey, you know, the Manassas Mauler uh, going around the country and just wiping the floor up with everybody kind of like our old school coach. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you have <laughs> you have all of these things going on in the 20s. And they began to write about them. They began to write about them. And then, remember, radio illuminated a lot of athletes because locally you could listen to things about athletes. But it became a prominent period in the 20s. And I, I stand by the facts that I've been given the greatest athletes of that time were the Babe, Jack Dempsey, Red Grange, and the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, Four Horsemen of Notre Dame. Um, that was just such a great time. And so then it brought into the 30s and 40s. Now, the 30s were difficult because of the crash. But, you know, the 40s were difficult because of the war. So, the you know... The war in the 20s was kind of, they were glamorized wars, you know, World War I. Um, and, and so they, as they produced these athletes from that time, it was a little bit different because there was no television, there wasn't a great newspaper, there wasn't great radio. But as that time progressed in the 20s and that began to happen, boy, oh boy, what a, what a dynamic period in American history. And, you know, you bring up a, a few characters in there you're a really big boxing fan as well in fact you were kind of involved in that industry as well as the nba yes indeed i, I actually I, I love boxing uh uh because boxing uh was what brought my father and i together uh, my father passed when i was eight years old but my memories of my dad are it was relative to sports um if he took me to my first Negro League games at four or five years old where I saw, uh, and I didn't know at the time the greatness that I was seeing, but Satchel Page and Josh Gibson, um, Buck Leonard, uh, Cool Papa Bell. Um, so that was with my dad. Now that was a gift that I didn't even comprehend at the time. But as we progressed through uh, four, five, six, seven years old, as you age, you know, your parents let you stay up a little later. You don't have to go to bed at the, at the crack of night. So, <laughs> so I would sit with my dad. I would look forward to Friday night because that's the night I could stay up late. And we had a little old radio. And my dad would turn on the radio. And I believe it was 9 or 10 o'clock. And the Gillette Cavalcade of Sports would come on. And there would be boxing. And they had a man by the name of Don Duffy who could describe the boxing match. Um, uh, and um, it's like the most incredible thing. Once I began to watch boxing, I'm saying this man is incredible. But my dad and I would sit there and listen to these fights. And that's where I listened to Joe Lewis, Jersey Joe Walcott, Ezit Charles, Rocky Marciano, Rocky Ooh. Graziano, yeah. uh, Sugar Ray Robinson. Ralph Tagger Jones, Gaspar Ortega, and I was just a little guy. Yeah. 
just a little guy, and I'm sitting here with my dad, and I can visually in my mind see the fighters just through the descriptions of John, of Don, Don Duffy. Okay, well, so we're coming to the end of, special. yeah, no, that's fantastic mm-hmm. stuff, and, and we're yeah. coming to the end of this half. In the next half mm-hmm. of the show, we'll pick up more on going back on, on Babe Ruth, and uh, you can mm-hmm. see we're going we're gonna to have fun because we're going to go through all of our love of sports and history, and um, it's going to be a blast on the show. So join us each week with Coach Ray Scott and me, Lori Lewis, on Walking with Giants, The View from 6'9". <laughs> 